Okay, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kristen. So, as Kristen indicated, uh, I'll try to provide an update to you uh, on the activities uh, of the US AMOC science team. And I'm a scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research and currently serving as the science team uh, chair. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, what the US AMOC science team is, it is actually an interagency uh, program uh, supported by NASA, NOAA, NSF, and US Department of uh, Energy. So what I wanted to do uh, here first is, again, for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, science team and the program, I wanted to provide a brief update on the background of the science team, uh, provide a background on science team objectives, uh, or its organization, and a very brief uh, history. Then I would like to show you some examples of ongoing projects uh, along with uh, recent uh, results. And I would like to finish with uh, some current and planned science team uh, activities. So uh, the USA Mark uh, program uh, objectives, uh, scientific objectives include implementation and evaluation of AMOC observing system, uh, assessment of AMOC state variability and change, assessment of AMOC variability mechanisms and predictability, and also the assessment of the role of AMOC in global climate and ecosystems. Uh, at the start of FY18, so uh, this fiscal year, uh, we had about 63 funded projects supported by the uh, four agencies that I uh, mentioned uh, in the uh, cover slide. So uh, this is uh, just to give you an idea about the organization of the US AMOC program. It is essentially the entire program consists of a science team. And the science team uh, includes uh, principal investigators, co eyes postdocs, and students performing AMOC related research designated by the funding agencies. So that I sort of represented that by the uh, sort of light green uh, area on this chart. Then, uh, pretty much along the lines of our scientific objectives, uh, we have uh, task teams, and they are uh, shown here from one to five. Uh, we have one on observing uh, system implementation and evaluation, another one on AMOC state variability and change, the third one is AMOC mechanisms and predictability, and the fourth is the climate sensitivity to AMOC. As I said, it includes climate and ecosystem impacts. We are actually in the uh, uh, formation process for task team five, focusing on the paleo AMOC uh, that came out of uh, several uh, a meeting uh, about it two years ago now. It is pretty much established, but we, are, we don't have the uh, chairs and the vice chairs yet for that uh, task team yet. We are waiting for the finalization of some of the proposals to essentially draw upon our chairs. The other chairs and co-chairs are listed in red in this uh, schematic here. They are currently serving uh, their ter terms. So the task team chairs and the vice chairs, along with myself, uh, form the executive committee of the science team. And the executive committee is essentially charged with identifying research needs to achieve the program objectives. Uh, we are trying to encourage and develop research activities to address these needs. Uh, executive team is also coordinating ongoing U.S. and, whenever possible, international research activities to address the program objectives. We summarize the state of science and program uh, progress, and I'll show you an example of that thing in a few uh, minutes. And uh, we also develop input to AMOC program reports uh, as necessary. Well, that is going to be the example that I'm going to show you in a minute. So just a brief uh, history of the U.S. AMOC uh, program. Uh, AMOC, and I'm assuming that everybody knows what AMOC is. It's the Atlantic Meridian Overturning Circulation. And I'm so immersed into it, that's why I keep using acronyms without necessarily defining it. Uh, in any case, AMOC uh, was identified as a near-term priority in 2007. And the first implementation plan uh, for AMOC uh, science activities was released later that year, and in essentially uh, March 2008, the U.S. AMOC science team uh, was formed. And uh, 
as I said, these, this team essentially includes PIs, COIs, students, and anybody else who are working on the uh, funded AMOC-related projects identified by the program managers of the funding uh, organization. Since uh, May 2009, uh, we started having uh, at least annual meetings, uh, annual PI meetings. And in starting in 2011, we essentially uh, started holding sort of alternating uh, US AMOC and international uh, science meetings. And the first of that was in 2011, and it was in uh, Bristol. And we had an external review of the program. Uh, it was very positive, and we made some adjustments based on the recommendations. Uh, and one of the adjustments, for example, defining more formal terms for the uh, uh, for the uh, terms of reference, essentially for the task teams and how the rotations of the leadership positions occur. And you can see that uh, we had uh, joint meetings in 2013 and then another one in 2014, uh, USA mock meeting. And the last meeting, joint meeting, was in 2015 in Bristol. And the joint meetings also alternate between US and the UK uh, with the UK RAPID uh, program. So our uh, is early in 2016, we were requested to go uh, uh, to sort of an 18-month schedule for our meetings and the uh, for our meetings, and that's what we did pretty much. We did not have any uh, official U.S. AMOC science team meeting in 2016. Uh, instead, we essentially sort of encouraged some participation in the Paleo uh, AMOC meeting that was held in Boulder in, in May 2016. Last year, we had our science team meeting in Santa Fe. Uh, and this year, actually end of this month, uh, during the last week of July, we are going to be hosting an international AMOC science team meeting in Miami. And I'll talk about that and show you a few slides on that thing uh, in a few minutes. I should mention that uh, in addition to all these meetings, uh, many of our science team members uh, have been organizing AMOC-related sessions at many me various meetings. Uh, these include Ocean Sciences, for example, AGO Fall Meeting, uh, that's another example. And this has been going on uh, since uh, the US AMOC science team uh, uh, was established. Uh, I'll talk about the sunsetting of the US AMOC uh, program uh, towards the end of my uh, talk. Uh, I should mention here that uh, we are going to have our last U.S. AMOC science team meeting sometime in spring uh, 2020. Uh, we haven't actually determined the location uh, for this meeting yet. As uh, I indicated in uh, the, one of the earlier slides, uh, one of the things that executive committee does uh, is uh, produce uh, progress and priority reports summarizing the activities of the U.S. AMOC uh, science team. And we have been doing this thing since about 2013. And the recent report covers are actually shown here. And the last one that we issued is just came out in May 2018. And if you notice that, I mean, unfortunately, you can't see the date on the 2016. Since we went to sort of 18-month schedule with our US AMOC science team meetings, uh, we follow the same schedule uh, with our uh, reports. And I. Personally, find these reports very, uh, uh, very useful. They are available from the USA uh, website. They actually provide a summary of the program activities, touching on all of the uh, related uh, projects, and they also include one to two page or sometimes slightly longer summaries from each of the projects that are funded under uh, under uh, that are funded by the. Uh, agencies related to AMOC. So it's a very useful uh, reference, essentially, uh, for anybody who is interested in AMOC-related uh, science. Another uh, activity uh, that uh, is ongoing, well, we stopped for the summer, uh, we have webinars. This initially started uh, with uh, at, as Task Team 3 uh, webinars. And we had five of them uh, over the past year. And we would like to now, I mean, these are now expanded to include presentations from other task teams. So we are essentially broadening the scope of these uh, webinars. And we are going to be asking for volunteers uh, for webinars uh, to start our uh, 
2018-2019 season. So if you know of anybody uh, who would like to volunteer, please send their names to us so that we can essentially schedule their presentations. And they're roughly about a month uh, apart. So with this, uh, now I would like to show you some highlights from some of the recent uh, activities of the science team. And I've been showing the rapid MOCA array uh, that's uh, at 26 and a half degrees north, time series for AMOC transport now for a while. And each year this is uh, being updated. So what this is uh, actually work done by, and for each of these updates, I also include the uh, essentially a reference. If it's published or if it's not published, simply the uh, name of the lead PI. So this is from Bill Johns. And as you are probably aware, uh, there has been an array uh, continuously monitoring the AMOC transport and the heat transport, both volume and heat transport at 26 and a half degrees north. Since about, in, uh, since about early 2004. This is updated all the way to early 2017, and the black line shows the total transport. The blue is the Gulf, uh, Gulf Stream contribution. The yellow line, sorry, the green line is the Ekman contribution, and the red line is the upper mid-ocean uh, contribution. So you can see that during the first uh, uh, five years or so, the AMOC uh, was sort of I would say maybe high-ish, order 19 sweat drop transport, and that was an event in 2009, it declined. This is mostly associated with changes in the wind-related uh, 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 forcings. Then AMOC uh, pretty much occupies a slightly lower transport state. And uh, this is largely coming from the upper mid-ocean uh, depth contribution. Now this has been actually, you, you may have seen many plots many papers about this thing, and it's just like the U.S. Constitution, how you interpret this time series. Many uh, studies actually put a line here and indicate that AMOC has been declining uh, since 2004, but my other interpretation that I like is essentially AMOC actually uh, went from maybe slightly higher state, and after 2009, a somewhat weaker state, and you can see that uh, 16 to 16 square drop was roughly the uh, average year, 15.7 to 2015, but then you can see actually an increasing of 17 to 0.2 to 17 uh, swear drops uh, during the later years. So I would not necessarily call this uh, an AMOC weakening or anything like that. And there's actually an associated uh, reduction in the meridional heat transport as well. During the first five years, it was ordered 1.33 petawatts, and between 11 and 15, it went down to 1.17, but there's going to be an increase actually over the last two years uh, associated with the increased uh, MOC. So my main message is that I, I don't think that there's a decline of AMOC. It is perhaps a slight weakening uh, regime, but you can see the increase towards the end of the, uh, end of the uh, record uh, here. Another... Uh, uh, Study. This just came out actually, GRL. This is focusing on the, uh, it's essentially a very similar uh, transect, but this time it's in the South Atlantic at 34.5 uh, degrees south. Chris Minen and all the collaborators, uh, well, quite a few collaborators here, Chris uh, was the lead author of this uh, study, they actually produced uh, transport temporal anomalies uh, for the AMOC essentially at 34.5 degrees south. Uh, roughly from 2009 uh, to early 2017. Uh, there's a gap uh, here because the eastern uh, side of the basin, uh, the instruments were not supported during this time, then they got the support uh, after uh, sort of late 2013. In any case, uh, so there is the, uh, there's quite a bit of the total uh, AMOC is shown up here in the black line. This is with respect to a mean of 14.7. Ekman, Eurotropic, and Burr-Clinic contributions are shown in the red, green, and the blue lines, respectively. And the remaining four lines, they essentially go further into detail as to whether the changes are, uh, how the essentially time uh, series are varying in the west and east sides for the Burr-Tropic and Burr-Clinic contributions. I don't want to get into much detail here, but you can see that uh, there's actually uh, not much of a trend at 34.5 degrees south. There's quite a bit of variability. 
Uh, I think this needs to be uh, checked against uh, what's happening at other uh, latitudes, like the latitude of the uh, rapid array. And one thing that I think Chris mentions in the paper is that uh, both the east and the west uh, changes that are happening in the east side and west side of the basin actually contribute to the changes in the uh, total transport. So you cannot really identify one side or the other as the main driver of uh, variability. Again, I don't think that there's much of a trend uh, in these uh, time series. A recent uh, observational program, uh, well, an, another observational program that started recently, and uh, they put the first instruments in, I believe, in 2014, is the OSNAP array. Uh, that stands for the overturning in the subpolar uh, North Atlantic. And the schematic of the array is shown in the upper uh, left panel here. It's essentially uh, Going in, it starts uh, here in the 53 sort of north area, covers the Labrador Sea, and all the way uh, across the uh, North Atlantic uh, to the European uh, continent. And early results were actually presented uh, in the uh, Ocean Sciences AMOC uh, sessions by Susan Lozier. And this is actually a plot showing the AMOC transport, meridional heat transport, and meridional freshwater transport for only I believe a 20 month uh, period. The black line is the AMOC transport. So the mean is about 15 uh, square drops. The, uh, the red line is showing the meridional heat transport. So there's quite a bit of uh, correlation between the heat transport and the overturning circulation transport. The blue line is the freshwater transport. And the correlation actually is negative. And these are very preliminary results. So they are, I believe, I don't know whether they figured it out or not, but they were trying to essentially figure out why the meridional freshwater transport is actually negatively correlating with the uh, overturning circulation volume transport itself. So these are all preliminary, very new results. And it is a great addition, actually. So we can now uh, look at AMOC coherency, for example, all the way from north to south. Uh, so this is, this is really nice. Uh, so these were the observational uh, sort of studies. Uh, there are other, uh, as I said, there are 63 studies uh, looking into various aspects of AMOC and North Atlantic variability. Uh, this is an example uh, from Marta Buckley's work. Uh, they are looking into origins of North Atlantic subpolar gyre heat content uh, changes. Specifically, uh, the top plot shows the upper ocean, upper 700 meter heat content change. Uh, for the 2015 to 2004 period. The scale is uh, degree C per year, so you can see essentially cooling uh, events uh, or cooling uh, trend happening in the northern North Atlantic. So the middle panel shows the uh, time series of the heat content for this box region here, and uh, this is in comparison with EN4 reanalysis product. And the blue line uh, is from the ECHO product. So this is, by the way, from all of the studies, essentially from ECHO. And uh, ECHO is, is, a, uh, is not a reanalysis product, per se. It is uh, essentially an adjoint model. And the forward part of the ECHO integration is a free-running simulation. Therefore, you, you can essentially look at uh, heat budget, uh, proper heat budget, and proper contributions or correct contributions to the heat budget. So, and the bottom panel is essentially showing that. Uh, these are, bottom panel is showing the, for the same period here, heat content uh, changes due to various co uh, contributions. So the black line is the actual tendency. A term, that's the gray line here, shows the anomalous horizontal gyre circulation or the advective contribution, horizontal gyre anomalous circulation acting on the mean temperature uh, gradients. The, the diffusion is the purple, uh, uh, the orange line here, and the yellow is the forcing. So their conclusion is that this uh, cooling in the North Atlantic is largely due to the anomalous horizontal gyre acting on mean temperature uh, gradient. Another uh, study, this is uh, Yen uh, and Rong Zhang is the, uh, another contributor to this uh, pa uh, paper. They looked at essentially the role of AMOC in the recent decline of Atlantic major uh, hurricane uh, frequencies. 
This is a plot uh, from their uh, manuscript. It's showing uh, it's for its time series of various things, and I'll just uh, get to them in a second. Uh, for the 1945 to 2015 uh, period. These are filtered data sets. So the gray shading is showing the Atlantic major hurricane uh, number, uh, low frequency uh, component. Uh, there's some uh, her inverted hurricane shear index. These are, by the way, these are not model results. These are coming from various uh, observational uh, data sets. The AMV index is the purple line here, uh, down here, dash line. And then the AMOC fingerprint, again, not model, but it's essentially they came up with an AMOC fingerprint that represented the, as the upper ocean heat content changes that's shown by the blue line. Rapid observations are shown here, and in this case, they put a trend, and I was just arguing that people should not do that, but anyway. The, uh, the bottom line here is that they are uh, finding that AMOC fingerprint uh, and the Atlantic major hurricane number go hand in hand. And they actually looked at anthropogenic forcing uh, changes, and they could not find any evidence linking anthropogenic, anthropogenic forcing changes to uh, hurricane activities. So one of their conclusions is that the hurricane activity is related to changes, naturally occurring changes in AMOC. And it, ocean dynamics actually is playing a major role in uh, determining a, uh, Atlantic hurricane activities. So another uh, point that I would like to make, oops, this came up on top of each other. This was supposed to be an animated slide, but I'll try to uh, go through this. So let's ignore the color plot for the time being. Uh, this is essentially uh, from one of our studies. Uh, it's just, uh, I think it's an early online release in Journal of Climate. We looked at the representation of North Atlantic low frequency variability. As you may aware, there are some studies essentially, and there's almost a debate, uh, indicating, uh, looking in, essentially arguing for uh, external forcing playing a role in AMOC or AMV, that's the Atlantic multidecadal variability, and the, low, uh, and the internal variability does not really do much. So, there have been several studies looking into CMIP-3 and CMIP-5 models saying that the model representation of low frequency variability is not good in the sense that uh, compared to observations, the low frequency variability in the models are not uh, matching the observational low frequency variability. So we have uh, actually looked at it in very many CSM simulations. So what the, uh, these sort of box plots show uh, from observations, from large ensemble uh, simulations uh, in CESM, this is from 1920 to uh, 2005 period, we have 40 ensemble members roughly, and this is from a pre-industrial control simulation, it's about 2200 years. So we looked at running five year, 15 year, and 30 year trends in these simulations. And uh, then these are plotted as the sort of the median is 50%. The box edges show the 25 and 75% range, 1 to 99% range. And the whiskers then show the, or the crosses show the uh, exceeding uh, sort of uh, anomalies beyond 1% and 99% levels here. The bottom line here is this is for NAO. We have done it for uh, upper ocean. Uh, uh, sorry, sea surface temperature, we have done it for AMOC. Uh, what we are finding is that for sort of sub-decadal and decadal time scales, model representation of variability is in, on par with the observational estimates. But unfortunately, you can't see it. You have to take my word for it for this plot. The 30-year trend estimate from the models are actually much lower than what the observations suggest. In fact, this one is showing for all the ensemble members that are used in our uh, study. This is the observational range, the blue line here. You can see the same range. These are 30-year individual uh, members. You can see actually it's much reduced. So the, the bottom line is that the, we think also in CESM, as in many other coupled models or uh, coupled models, the representation of low frequency variability is low frequency variability in the North Atlantic is underrepresented compared to available observational estimates. Why do we care? Well, I mean, I, I wanted to show you this color plot now. 
This is now showing uh, AMOC 30-year trend, and PC1, principal component one time series, is used for this purpose, and these are moving trends. 35 ensemble members are shown here, uh, starting from 1920. So 1920 is the first 30-year trend between 1920 and 1950. It ends in 1980. That is the 30-year trend 19, from 1980 to 2010. The bottom row is the ensemble mean of these 35 ensemble members. Forced ocean simulation is shown here. That's our truth. You can see that there is quite a bit of difference between what our forced ocean simulation is seeing, what AMOC behavior should be, versus what the free running simulations are seeing. So this is essentially uh, indicating that, I mean, we don't have the low frequency variability represented in these models. And therefore, whatever the anthropogenic forcing impacts are, that's what we see in the fully coupled uh, simulations. And then this can as, uh, essentially uh, may lead to meet some misleading uh, conclusions as, with respect to the roles of external versus internal uh, forcing. So I'm running late here. So in the interest of time, I'll skip this one. Uh, the bottom line here is that there's another study saying that people should be careful interpreting whether AMOC is stable or not stable simply based on the sign of the freshwater transport at the southern entrance to the South Atlantic. And in many studies that has been used as an indicator of AMOC stability, but uh, studies looking into both GFDL, ESM, 2M, and CSM models, uh, this is one of our work, we could not find any link between the sign of the FOB and the AMOC, essentially. So people need to be careful because this particular uh, stability criteria is based on really box models. There are a bunch of assumptions going underneath that. Uh, so uh, I think we don't know what the AMOC stability should be. So with that now, I would like to uh, go back to uh, some of our activities. Uh, as I indicated, our next international AMOC science meeting is going to be happening in Florida, in Miami, and it's scheduled for uh, 24 to 27th of uh, July. We will be focusing, uh, the, these are the meeting teams. Uh, we have AMOC as a 4D uh, process uh, session. Another session will be looking into AMOC proxies and fingerprints. And finally, uh, uh, a third session is a, or well, it's not just third session, the third theme is the AMOC in a changing uh, climate. Uh, feedback between AMOC and climate, extreme weather, sea level, and any changes in cryosphere and carbon cycle and ecosystems uh, will be discussed. Uh, another important uh, focus of the meeting is essentially uh, on the last day, we have half a day to focus on state of understanding of AMOC identifying gaps and come up with sort of to the extent possible a forward-looking uh, science uh, objective or objectives or science efforts uh, with lots of questions hopefully. This is essentially going into our sunsetting activities. And as I say sunsetting, uh, the US AMOC science team will be sunsetting uh, at the end of December in 2020. So we are now uh, uh, trying to come up with activities uh, that are going to essentially maintain our momentum uh, until 2020 and legacy activities that are going to go beyond uh, uh, 2020. Sunsetting does not necessarily mean that uh, agencies are going to suddenly stop AMOC-related uh, research activities or their funding. Uh, those activities are still going to uh, continue but the coordination uh, or collaboration under the U.S. AMOC science team umbrella uh, will not exist after uh, December uh, 2020. And people will be still submitting proposals. There will be still uh, funded uh, work. So as part of our uh, sunsetting uh, activities, uh, we are going to have uh, several uh, efforts, uh, planned efforts, and we can add more uh, to uh, these. In fact, it's, these are going to be discussed at our upcoming meeting as well. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we want to essentially, uh, in terms of collaborations, we want to make sure that the transition of current program to program collaborations uh, go into other activities, such as you get RAPID or Atlantos in EU, 
or other U.S. and international PIVAR uh, task teams or uh, working uh, groups. Uh, we are revising our near-term and long-term priorities uh, to reflect ongoing research needs extending beyond the science team. Uh, I'll come back to legacy products in a second, but in, in terms of communication also, uh, we are uh, uh, trying to advertise our sunsetting plans, seek community input, and making sure that our activities and legacy activities or legacy products remain on the web uh, beyond the completion of the uh, task team. So going back to legacy products, uh, just I'll give you three examples uh, here. One of them is uh, AMOC uh, science team members are actively participating in uh, AMOC observing requirements, for example, for OceanOps 19, and there will be at least one or two uh, white papers uh, coming out of the uh, science team. Another major effort that we are undertaking is uh, we are preparing actually an AMOC virtual special collection in AGU uh, journals. These, uh, we have identified 11 uh, papers, and the lead authors and co-leads are uh, given here, along with the target uh, journal. And these are ongoing. Uh, in fact, one of them, by Rong Zhang, number two, has been already submitted uh, to reviews of uh, geophysics. And the submission deadline is May to end of October. This may be slightly extended, uh, perhaps, to the end of the uh, year. So this is going to be one of our legacy products. The goal here is that provide a review, identify the contributions of the US AMOC program, along with the UK RAPID program and other international collaborations, and then try to essentially identify future pathways to sustain some of these efforts and how the science should go uh, forward. And another uh, product uh, that uh, I'm happy to uh, highlight here is the AMOC uh, metrics. Uh, this has been uh, sort of, uh, we're trying to get funding for this effort, for this project, and it, I'm happy to say that it is finally funded. It is funded by NOAA, uh, three NOAA programs, CVP, MAP, and CM, and DOE RGCM programs. It's a collaboration between NCAR Los Alam, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, PCMDI in particular, and GFDL. But I should mention that this is actually a broader collaboration. I'll come back to that thing in a second. So the idea is to compare model simulations with observations of the natural world uh, to the extent, identically to, to the extent possible in a very similar uh, way. So we are trying to essentially provide apples to apples comparisons between observations and models. And this has been identified in many science team reports, this need going back to 2013. And this was also essentially highlighted as a need uh, in the Paleo uh, AMOC uh, meeting, and as well as the subsequent meeting report that came out last year. So uh, the, this is a service activity. Uh, we are going to try to promote the use of metrics in intercomparison projects that are relevant to advancing understanding of the Atlantic Ocean state, circulation, and influence. Uh, the goal is also, also to reflect the science advances being driven by the US AMOC, uh, or the, by the AMOC community. I shouldn't say US, it's the entire AMOC community. Facilitate the joint interpretation of models and data, and promote objectivity in model intercomparisons. So all the products and tools will be open source, curated, uh, that will allow, as I said, apples to, apple com uh, apples to apples comparisons of observations and models. I should also stress that not just observations and models, uh, the goal is also to provide comparisons of observations to observations, because observations are using different methods to come up with their transport estimates, and you may end up with different trends. So the goal is essentially try to uh, put them in a common uh, sort of framework as well. And uh, our initial uh, sort of task is uh, there's already some work done with the rapid observations, but we'll try to do uh, start with North Brazil Current, Move Array, Line W, and 53 uh, North Transport. I should have also included here uh, the uh, SAMOC, array uh, results as well. So that's going to be included uh, as well. Uh, so I don't want to repeat these, but the goal is essentially to produce uh, 
an algorithm or framework that matches observations and models in their computations of uh, transports. And finally, uh, related to AMOC metrics, uh, we have uh, already some partnerships and natural uh, synergies that we can essentially tap into. Uh, first of all, our big partners is US AMOC science team. In fact, this is going to be uh, discussed in a session at the uh, evening session, I think, at the uh, upcoming international meeting. Our uh, DOE partner, PCMDI, it is going to go into the metrics package. And once we do that, this directly goes into ops for MIPS and CMIP archives. So our goal is essentially not one and done in a sense, uh, but making sure that any tools and data sets that are coming out of this project, they will get served through the, AMOC metric, uh, the PCMDI metrics package, and they can be used for old or new CMIP uh, 6, 7, 8 uh, simulations. So that's actually a pretty important uh, bullet here. We have direct connections to Ocean Model Development Panel uh, from CLIVAR or MDP, and we can do direct comparisons and use of these metrics in the Ocean Model Intercomparison Project, that's OMIT. We are going to include these metrics in the NCAR also, Climate Variability Diagnostics Package. We will advertise the packages within CLIVAR, CLIVAR Global Synthesis and Observations Panel uh, they also have an ocean reanalysis intercomparison project that can be used for this purpose. And I think uh, Atlantic Regional Panel is going to provide another conduit for us uh, to expand the use of these uh, metrics and also provide input to us as to how these, uh, what we should be focusing on uh, after the first preliminary stages. So with that, I would like to just conclude and thank you for listening and take questions if you have any. I took longer than 30 minutes, actually. Sorry. <laughs>